the uh, the life of Gomer. Okay, now on Sunday nights I'm preaching through Hosea, and honestly I still haven't been able to dig into the book enough like I like to be before I preach an expository message like that. And so I've preached on some pretty basic uh, just thoughts from the book. And uh, last week we talked about last Sunday night I talked about the children of whoredoms, and uh, uh, just anyway doesn't didn't really go with the just expository preaching of the of the sermon here. But there are some interesting things to consider because really, like if you're just reading through the Bible and you get to this, that first chapter in Hosea might kind of blow you away. You're just like, what in the world is going on? And so interesting to talk about some of these uh, subjects. But as I was studying that and reading that, this didn't really go with my uh, series on Sunday on Sundays. But I thought, you know, we've hit on a couple prophets. Uh, you know, we talked about Jonah, prophecy concerning Jonah here uh, recently and and uh, I don't remember what the other prophet was I talked about. But anyway, we hit on some of the prophets. And so I wanted to just kind of continue that idea for a little while. And so this somewhat lesser known book of Hosea, lesser known prophet, is, uh, is quite a story. But it's one that's really puzzling. Okay, And it's going to deal with uh, you know, a woman. It's going to talk a lot about this woman who is a whorish woman. And interchangeable with it also talks about playing the harlot. So it also talks about harlotry, also talks about adultery. All these things, uh, you know, are talking about the same person. And uh, we don't know a lot about Gomer. You know, this is the the wife he was, uh, that Hosea is told to marry. So let me read that again. Verse 2 says, The beginning of the word of the Lord by Hosea. And the Lord said to Hosea, Go take unto thee a wife of whoredoms, and children of whoredoms, for the land hath committed great whoredom, departing from the Lord. So he went and took Gomer, the daughter of Diblaim, which conceived and bare him a son. And then he goes and talks about the names of the son. The names are somewhat prophetic, and and uh, and you know I'm not going to get into that right now too much. Uh, uh, comparing that with chapter two, uh, but basically he has a daughter and two sons. And it's a little bit confusing because we don't have a whole lot of information here. We don't really know anything about the background of uh, Gomer. You know, this is the only time really we've heard about it. The only other Gomer in the Bible is a man, and uh, it's in Genesis. And uh, and then we have uh, here where it talks about Gomer, this woman who is, it calls, uh, the daughter of Diblaim. Okay? Now I'm going to get back and talk with that uh, for a minute. But... Uh, I mean, as far as who, what, who her, who this uh, Diblium is, but it says that he's in God's telling him, this is God's instruction to Hosea. And he's telling him to go and to marry a wife of the whoredoms. Now, you know, it's been kind of debated. Nobody really knows exactly what this means in the, in that it could mean somebody who was already a prostitute, somebody who was already a whore. And he's saying, Hey, go marry that person or somebody who he knew was going to be unfaithful to him. And so he marry them, even though you know that they're going to be unfaithful. Regardless, the picture that he was trying to teach by this, and this isn't the only time that God's used somebody and their wife to paint a picture for, uh, for us to read later on. You know, Ezekiel, he lost his wife. His wife died, and the instruction was, don't cry. You're not allowed to cry. And the reason was because that was a picture of what, how the nation was going to be. They're going to go through all this sorrow, and they're not even going to be able to cry. And, and uh, Ezekiel also talks about an analogy very similar to this, where God says that he married a whore, basically. And so uh, it's, it's really interesting to talk about that, and it seems so counterproductive, I mean, counterintuitive that God would tell him to go to, a, regardless of, of you know, her story, uh, go to this woman, Gomer, who was... A, uh, a a woman of whoredoms. So before I go any farther, let me just start off right away by talking about the seriousness of the sin of adultery, because this is what this is about. Now he's using a picture about the unfaithfulness of of Israel and the Judah to God. Right? They went after you know false gods, and they went after all the lust of the flesh, and they went after. Uh, worldliness and stuff like that. And so he's using that as a picture of, hey, you know, you were in this married relationship to God and then you departed from God and you went after other quote unquote lovers as, as the analogy goes. Okay. 
But we understand by him using this analogy, we understand what he's getting at is that adultery is a very bad thing. Now, in this in our culture today, you know, it's not really that big of a deal. It's pretty common. Uh, whereas back, you know, many years ago, this it was it was very much shameful that somebody would be called uh, such a thing. And then go back even farther than that, they were put to death, right, for for committing adultery. So let me just real quickly go over some things about adultery, why it's so bad. Okay, the Bible starts out uh, in, uh, well, actually, let's look at Matthew first, okay? And then we'll look at the passage that Jesus is quoting. So in Matthew chapter 19, These old uh, Pharisees always trying to trip Jesus up, always trying to uh, tempt him. And it says, The Pharisees also came unto him, tempting him, and saying unto him, Is it lawful for a man to put away his wife for every cause? And he answered and said unto them, Have ye not read that he which made them at the beginning made them male and female, and said, For this cause shall a man leave father and mother, and shall cleave to his wife, and they too shall be one flesh? Wherefore? Uh, wherefore they are no more twain, but one flesh. What therefore God hath joined together, let not man put asunder. Okay, and uh, and I want you to notice too what happened here. Look at verse ten. Well, let me. You know what? Let me just keep on reading. Where did I pick, stop? Uh, verse six. Let's keep reading. Verse seven. They saith unto him, Why did Moses then command to give a writing of divorcement and to put her away? He said unto them, Moses, because of the hardness of your heart, suffered you to put away your wives, but from the beginning it was not so. And I say unto you, whosoever shall put away his wife, except it be for fornication, shall marry, uh, and shall marry another, committeth adultery. And whoso marrieth her uh, which is put away, doth commit adultery. His disciples say, uh, uh, th his disciples say unto him, if the case of man be so with his wife, it is not good to marry. And then Jesus goes on talking about, hey, well, you know, not very many people can go without being married. This is a good thing. This, And, you know, I just talked recently about how marriage is such a good thing. It's the perfect thing in the sense that God made, ma uh, made mankind. He made a male and female. And he said, come together, be fruitful, multiply. Like this is like the perfect thing that you could do in this life outside of, you know, your relationship with Jesus Christ is to get married become one flesh, have a child, and now you got a family. I mean, that's everything working perfectly. But in our, uh, you know, in our human nature, in our flesh, you know, we've kind of messed that up and we've, we've created all these different scenarios that make it much harder. And so God had to deal with those scenarios and he gave certain rules on how to deal with that. But Jesus uh, quotes back uh, to Genesis where he says, in the beginning, God created male and female and he said, you know, let not the twain, you know, let let them not uh, uh, let, uh, let them, well. Let's just go there. <laughs> Hold your place, though, because I'm gonna come right back. Let's go to Genesis two. Genesis two twenty four. Therefore, shall a man leave his father and mother. This is what Jesus was quoting, and shall cleave unto his wife, and they shall be one flesh. And they were both naked the man and his wife, and were not ashamed. Okay, so you know how that story goes there in, in uh, Genesis uh, chapter 2 there. So look at, uh, back to Matthew 19. Now I want you to notice that he said, uh, well, I lost my place, but, <laughs> but follow the story here. Je the disciples said, well, if this is the case, right, because Jesus says, hey, don't separate. You're not supposed to divorce. And if you divorce, you're committing adultery. And the person that you put away, you know, if they get remarried, then they're, you know, that's causing them to commit adultery. And he's saying this is a big deal. So his disciples naturally are like, well, man, in that case, it would be better not even to get married. And if you think about that, that makes sense because the Bible talks a lot about vows and keeping vows. And it was such a big deal that they keep the vows that to the point that if they broke it, you know, that was a great dishonorable thing. So let's look at that for a minute about the vows, okay? And if you think about that, marriage is a serious vow. When people get up there, a lot of people don't even think of it as vows, I guess, anymore. But they actually say their vows to each other. Now, I don't know. I haven't been to a, a, a wedding and, a, you know, maybe a, a modern type wedding outside of one that's been done in a, in a Baptist church or something like that. 
So maybe I'm wrong here, but I believe that they still, the vowels are still pretty close to the same where it's like, you know, I mean, I think a lot of people have created some weird ones. <laughs> it used to be like, you know, in, in, in sickness and in health, you know, for richer, for poorer, uh, till death do us part. I mean, all these things, but have they changed that now? Did they not give those vows anymore? It's like, until we're done with each other, <laughs> you know what I mean? Then we're, you know, but it used to be a vow like, hey, till death do us part, you know, and, and this is what he's saying. Let not man put asunder, right? And, uh, and so nowadays there's, uh, you know, there's a departure from that, but that is a vow. That's a sacred vow. Now we're not supposed to make a lot of vows. And the reason why is because if you make a vow and you break it, that's a big deal. And so it's better not even to make the vow. The Bible makes this very clear. Look, uh, uh, look at James chapter 5. James chapter 5, verse 32. <laughs> here we go again. There is no 532. Uh, let's see here. What did I do? None of them have 32 verses. I, th I'm th I think it was, let me see here. I know it's James 5. Oh, James 5, 12, sorry. But above all things, my brethren, swear not, neither by heaven, neither by the earth, neither by any other oath, but let your yea be yea and your nay be nay, lest ye fall into condemnation. Now look back to uh, Ecclesiastes chapter 5. Ecclesiastes chapter 5. Seems like a weird place for this verse in the book of Ecclesiastes, but here's where, it, where we find it. <clears throat> Ecclesiastes chapter 5, look at verse 4. Ah. When thou vowest a vow unto God, defer not to pay it. For he hath no pleasure in fools. Pay that which thou hast vowed. Better is it that thou shouldest not vow than that thou shouldest vow and not pay. All right, one last place. Look at Ju Judges chapter 11. I mean, one last place for this point. <laughs> There's a whole lot more uh, verses to look at. Judges. And go to chapter 11. All right, Judges 11. Verse 30. Now, Jephthah was one of the judges mentioned here in, in the book of Judges, and he wins this battle, and, uh, and, and, and you know, he's making this deal with the Lord. He says, uh, what did I say, 26? No, uh, ver starting verse 30. And Jephthah vowed a vow unto the Lord and said, If thou shalt without fail deliver the children of Ammon into mine hands, then it shall be that whatsoever cometh forth of the doors of my house to meet me when I return in peace from the children of Ammon shall surely be the Lord's, and I will offer it up for a burnt offering. So Jephthah passed over, uh, passed over unto the children of Ammon to fight against them, and the Lord delivered them into his hands, and he smote them for a roar, even till, they, till uh, thou come to the... To, I'm sorry, from Aurora, even until thou come to Mineth, even 20 cities and unto the plain of the vineyards with a very great slaughter. Thus the children of Ammon were subdued before the children of Israel. And Jephthah came to Mizpah unto his house and behold, his daughter came out to meet him with timbrels and with dances. And she was his only child. Beside her, he had neither son nor daughter. And it came to pass when he saw her, that he ran his clothes and said, Alas, my daughter, thou hast brought me very low, and thou, like it's her fault, and thou art one of them that trouble me, for I have opened my mouth unto the Lord, and I cannot go back. And she said unto him, My father, if thou hast opened thy mouth unto the Lord, do to me according to that which has proceeded out of thy mouth, for as much as the Lord hath taken vengeance for thee of thine enemies, even of the children of Ammon. And he said unto her, and she said unto her father, Let this thing be done for me. 
Let me alone two months that I may go up and down upon the mountains and bewail my virginity, I and my fellows. And he said, go. And he sent her away for two months. And she went with her companies and uh, bewailed her virginity upon the mountains. And it came to pass at the end of two, two months that she returned unto her father who did uh, with her according to his vow, which he had vowed. And she knew no man. And it was a custom in Israel uh, that the daughters of Israel went yearly to lament the daughter of Jephthah, the Gileite, four days in a year. Now, some commentaries have tried to soften this up a little bit. And they say, oh, you see this whole thing about bewailing her virginity and all that. They say, well, he didn't really put her to death. Basically, she just was never allowed to have relations you know, with men. And so she wasn't allowed to have any children. But the thing is, he says it very, very clearly. He did that which he you know, had vowed to do. And what he had vowed to do is to sacrifice whatever comes through the door. Now, who would agree with me that that was a stupid vow to make? <laughs> I mean, it's a stupid vow. Whatever comes through those doors. I mean, he's probably got servants that live in his house. He's got his wife that lives in his house. He's got his kid, well, his daughter that lives in the house. You know, probably some animals that live in his house. That's the only way I can reason that he probably thought. Because back in that day, it was common because of the weather and everything. The animals would live like on the, you know, I've heard it said that they lived like on the first floor. And then everybody else kind of lived up on the second floor, which yeah, that's probably good for heating and stuff like that. But uh, you think about the animals on the first floor. And anyway, <laughs> so they would, uh, uh, that's really what they would do, right? So maybe that's what he was thinking is an animal's going to come out of there. But regardless, that was a stupid thing not to think about the fact that your daughter might come out of here. And so then when she comes out of the door, he's like, oops, I made this vow and said, I'm going to sacrifice whatever comes out of the door. And it was my daughter. And so he like gets on to her, man, you've brought me to a low point, right? And so now I've got to sacrifice you to the Lord. And she's like, all right, go ahead. You may. <laughs> now, that seems like a weird story, but I'm going to tell you this. How many of you guys think it was right for him to sacrifice his daughter? No, that was a, that was a sinful thing to do. That was a wicked thing to do, right? But how many think it's right for him to break his vow to the Lord? That's a sinful thing to do. That's a wicked thing to do. But he got himself into this situation. Now, now what am I going to do? I either, you know, live with the consequences of my action, you know, my, my vow, or I break my vow. And he chose, I'm not going to break my vow. I'm going to live with the consequences here. But, uh, but this is the situation that sin gets us into. This is the situation that making vows gets us into. This is a situation that breaking vows gets us into. Now what am I going to do? I got to choose the lesser of two evils here. I got to, I got to, both things are wrong. What do I do? And that was his decision to make. You know, God certainly didn't require him to make one decision or the other. And uh, he made what seems like the last decision in the world I would have made. But he said, it's so important not to break my vow that I would even sacrifice my own daughter. Now, I can't imagine that. And it wasn't right to do, to sacrifice your daughter. But he would not break his vow because there was a time when our word meant something. When we said we were going to do something, especially to God, we kept that vow. And that's a very, very serious thing. And so when we make a vow before God and before our wife or our husband and say that, uh, I mean, not our husband, because I'm a guy and I would never have a husband, but you know what I mean, our husband or wife vow, then we know that that is, that is something that we're supposed to keep. And unfortunately, we are human and, uh, and we have not, you know, and I'm going to get to this in the, uh, here pretty soon. We, we have fallen short of that. And so, unfortunately, we got into all kinds of sins. Now, the Bible also uses marriage consistently as a picture of the relationship between God and, the, and, and His people, okay? Or in the New Testament, particularly about between Christ and the church, okay? Ephesians 5, 32, he's talking about, a mar about marriage, about the wife submitting herself to the husband, and about the husband loving his wife. And he says, this is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ in the church. So he's using that relationship as a picture, just like he is in Hosea. Uh, and so we are learning from that lesson. And this is why God also uses the word adulterer, or he talks about the great whore in Revelation, or the harlot. And he's talking about all those times he's talking about those who should be God's people. They should have been doing God's work, the religious leaders or whatever. And instead, they went after the things of the world or they went after false gods and they did all this wicked stuff. And he's saying, look, you are no longer in that relationship with me as a nation because you've played the whore, you've played the harlot. So this gets into the story that we're talking about, okay, in Hosea. Now, I want to pause for a minute and take a quite a different approach 
when it comes to the life of, of Gomer. And then I'll get back to uh, this idea about the, the adultery. But this is an awful thing that Hosea, for Hosea. You know, and it's a weird thing, actually, if you think about it, for God to ask him to do this. And, of course, like I said, it's a picture. God has a reason for it. There's a lot of interesting things in the Bible that God has his prophets do so that we can learn from it and, and be able to pass down these stories. But this seems like a very weird thing that God would tell Hosea to marry the wife of whoredoms. Okay, but I want you to notice this about, about Gomer. Okay, the, I'm going to have to use a lot of like artistic license here because we really don't have a whole lot on Gomer. We're going to use our imagination, though, because I think there's some things that we could we could speculate, or or at least ponder. It's okay to just ponder these things. I'm not asking, and we're not considering any foolish questions or anything like that. This is just something I want you to think about. <clears throat> All right, what was Gomer's life like growing up? Well, we really don't know, but if you consider the fact that it says, "Go to Gomer, the daughter of Diblam," uh, uh, and uh, let me see here. Go to uh, and take the wife of whoredoms and children of whoredoms. Uh, and then it talks about her being the daughter of Diblium. I want you to first consider this. Diblium is actually a female name. Now, some commentaries have said that this is her dad. Other commentaries have said that this is her mother. But when you look it up, my understanding is that this is a female name. So <clears throat> we're not seeing... Like usually the Bible talks about so and so, the daughter of, and then it lists the man's name, or the you know the son of so and so, you know, and it lists the man's name. It's always talking about the father, but here it doesn't talk about the father. If I'm right on this being a female name, it talks about Diblam, who is a woman. Now that's interesting because what that implies, if that's true, is that there was no husband around. Okay, so here is a scenario that I want to just pose to you that it might very well be true that Gomer might be doing the only thing she knows how to do. It could very well be, and I think there's reason to believe that she was raised by a harlot. She was raised, and all she knew about men was, you know, what to know about men and what to do, how to please a man and, and all this stuff. And so it could be that she was raised in that lifestyle with no father, no, uh, no understanding of that, and she just did what has been passed down. So just like her mother was a harlot, hypothetically, it passed down. She was the children. She was a child of the harlot. And so now she ends up, or whoredoms, I should say, and now she is a wife of whoredoms because she ends up marrying uh, Hosea, which brings us to another point. Now, how did she end up marrying Hosea? Because obviously she wasn't marrying material. And here is a man of God, a prophet. You know, imagine it would be a little difficult for a woman, especially a woman of the world, in that kind of situation, to marry a, a prophet of God. You know, and, uh, and how do they go about marrying in those days? Well, you look all throughout the Bible, and it's almost always a deal, an arrangement between the man and the, the family, right? The, 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 the parents. And they're like, hey, I want to have your daughter. And, uh, and uh, what they would often have to do is pay them a bunch of money, right? I was going to make a joke about Austin, but that wouldn't be appropriate. <laughs> so, uh, but you, you understand what I'm saying, okay? They would, have to, they would have to pay this. Now, listen to this. Now, you go to, in this case, this G Gomer's, you know, mother is raising her. And here comes... Uh, I'm sorry, I distracted. Quit laughing. Okay, so uh, so Gomer's uh, uh, mother, you know, Hosea comes to her. All right, let's assume I'm right, and she's a she's a prostitute. Now Gomer is gonna, I mean, uh, Hosea is gonna offer her money to buy her daughter. What do you think she's gonna do? She's gonna take it. She's gonna take the money. Hey, this is great. Now I don't have to take care of you. You got a man that can take care of you. But this woman's not marrying material. All she knows is the life of whoredoms. And her mom's been, been a whore. This is what I think is a very strong possibility. And so she grows up this way. Let me give you another example possibility, okay? Now, if you look up, and again, I don't know Hebrew. The Bible doesn't say it, so it's kind of, you know, I'm just speculating here. But uh, apparently, if you look this up, Diblam has something to do with figs or like, uh, like two fig cakes or something like that, okay? And if you look at verse 2, let me see, uh, chapter 2, verse 12.
says, I will destroy her vines and her fig trees, whereof she hath said, These are my rewards that my lovers have given me. And I will make them for us. So he's saying, God's saying the punishment. And he's making the analogy with Israel here. But he's saying, he said, this is, uh, uh, you know, I'm going to take those fig trees, which you said, hey, this is, uh, this is my reward. Okay. Now, one possibility is that this name, uh, Diblium, he's talking about the fig cakes or whatever, possibly could have been an understanding, like, like a nickname that she got because that was the reward that she got, the price, if you will, for what she did for a living, right? The price was, hey, you give me these figs or you give me these. And so it's, it's I, you know, I'm leaning towards thinking that that's what it is. There's not a whole lot in the Bible to show us that for sure, but I'm leaning towards what that is. And it makes sense, you know, that they would have just been, this would have been in the a business in the family, family business, just passed down generations or whatever, and they don't know any different. And you got the wife of, uh, or the, the mother of whores here, and then you got the children of whores, because they don't know any, they don't know any different, and this is the situation of what we see that uh, that Hosea is going to marry. Now Hosea, you know, he's a man of God. He's he's a he's a prophet. Probably kind of boring, you know. I mean, I guess the life of a prophet wouldn't necessarily be boring, but you know, kind of from her point of view, like he's just a nobody. Probably didn't have a whole lot of money. You know, I'm guessing not like the men that she had probably been running around with, the rich and the wealthy people who were you, who were buying, you know, some time with her or whatever. And she calls them her lovers and she keeps going after them uh, because, you know, she's drawn to them. She probably had no attraction to Hosea. She's just in a relationship because Hosea paid the price and 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 had her. Now, again, God's using this illustration to show us this is a representation of his people who would decide, you know what, I don't want to, I no longer want to be in this relationship. I want to go after these other. And so there's this, you know, hey, you're supposed to be mine, but here I'm having to share you with these other with these other men. And uh, and so this is how God feels because we as his as his people, you know, oftentimes will go and I'm, you know, I realize the main application here was in that time talking about the Jews. But think about it today. You know, uh, look at look at uh, uh, James. I'll just read it to you. James four four says, "Ye adulterers and adulteresses." Now he's not in this context really talking about people who have committed adultery. He's talking about spiritually. He says, "Ye adulterers and adulteresses, know ye not that the friendship of the world is enmity with God? Whosoever therefore will be a friend of the world is enemy of God." So you can rest assured that we could apply that to ourselves. And say, hey, we are God's people. When we go after the world or worldly lust, you know, all that's in the world, lust of the eyes, lust of the flesh, pride of life, you know, these things aren't of God. And so if we go after these things, we're actually being an en enemy of God. And we're definitely not loving Him and entering into that relationship as we ought to be. Uh, look at, uh, if, but if you think about this, okay, so that actually adds to me a layer of the story of Gomer. Because if you think about it, now I'm not a Calvinist, and so the whole depravity, if you're familiar with the uh, the Calvinism, like the, uh, the the TULIP, you know, is the acronym. that Calvin didn't come up with that, but somebody put it into an acronym, T-U-L-P-I, uh, how do you spell TULIP? T-U-L-I-P, or T-U-L-I-P, yeah. That's the five points of Calvinism. Well, the first one, the T, stands for total depravity, okay? Now, look, I don't believe in any of the five points of Calvinism, but here's what I do know. We can't deny the fact that man is depraved, okay? Now, I'm not talking about, you know, see, because the idea of Calvinism, to some extent, is that, you know, you can't do anything. You can't come to faith unless God puts the faith in you and all this kind of stuff. Like, I don't believe that. I believe we all have a measure of faith within us, and we have the capability of coming to the Lord, or else he wouldn't have said, whosoever will may come. All right, so I don't believe in Calvinism. Don't get me wrong. But here's what I do believe, that we are destined to fail as, as human beings, all right? Now, we can't really, we don't want to blame Adam, because at the end of the day, we're the one that chooses to sin. But the Bible says that death passed upon all men for that all have sinned. Okay, so we could say, well, we can't help it. We're just the offspring of Adam, and Adam was a sinner, so therefore we have to be a sinner. There's some truth in that. There's some truth in that. But honestly, you know, it's your decision to sin, which is what's going to, you know, cause you 
to deserve to go to hell. I mean, even a lie, you know, Revelation 21, 8, all liars shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone. So even telling a lie, like you've fallen short of God's perfection, you know, uh, all of sin and come short of the glory of God. And so, uh, and so in our human state, you know what we're doing? We're being human when we, you know, now I'm not condoning it. I'm not saying it's right. But at the end of the day, how could we as such an imperfect people who've been raised by imperfect parents in an imperfect world, imperfect society, imperfect uh, nation, imperfect laws, I mean, how could we expect anything less than the fact that we are going to mess up? And uh, look at Psalm 103, 14. Psalm 103, 14. For he knoweth our frame, he remembereth that we are dust. You know, at some point, remember God destroys the earth, you know, with the flood. And then he's like, you know what? I'm never going to do this again. Now, he is going to destroy the world by fire one day. But he's like, I'm not going to do this again. Like, I know that mankind is just sinful, right? And he remembers here in Psalm, he's like, he, he remembers that they are but dust, okay? God knows that every one of us is a sinner. Every one of us is capable of committing all different numbers of gross sins. And we have. And we, if it was truth be known, if everybody knew every sin that everyone in here has committed or every thought that everybody has in here thought, that'd be a terrible thing, right? Because God knows uh, that w what we are capable of. And here is the beauty of the story of Hosea and, and Gomer, right? Because it's a weird story up until this point. But the beauty in that story is what we see in Romans 5.8. Go there. Most of you already have it memorized, but look at Romans 5.8. You see, Gomer in the story here, she's going to basically run away from home and go after her lovers and and uh, think that they're the ones that are taking care of her and all this stuff when they're really not. And then Hosea is actually going to go and he's going to pay for her to get her back. Right? He's paying for the one that has, has been unfaithful and has cheated on him and he's paying to get him back. The Bible says in Romans 5, 8, it says, uh, uh, well, let me back up and get a running start to this. Okay, So it says in verse 6, For when we were yet without strength, in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man would one die. Yet peradventure for a good man, some would even dare to die. But God committed his love toward us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And so the beauty of the story is that God has understood that at the end of the day, we are sinful flesh. Now we're going to pay for the sins. You know, we're going to be... Uh, shamed, we're going to be punished by God. Uh, and look, you can't read Hosea and find out that God, God's not just winking at that and being like, hey, no big deal. He's going to punish it harshly. Okay, but at the end of the day, what it comes down to is not focusing on how sinful and how frail the people are that commit sins, because they, that's for sure, but focusing on the fact that, you know what, Jesus Christ still died for those sinners. Okay. Now, there's a matter of disciplining those who are his that commit those same sins that, you know, that the, that the world would commit. But at the end of the day, Christ uh, died. He paid that price and uh, wiped away those sins. Okay, so, uh, so this is a hard thing to understand. But then to just turn our back on God continually, and we do. He died for us. He's forgiven us of our sins whenever we got saved. Uh, past, present, and future are all forgiven. So then what, what do we do? We kind of spit on that and we, and we make a mockery of that and we continue in sin. We still go after the world. We still go after our own pleasures and the lust of the eyes and the lust of the flesh and, and the pride of life. I mean, these are the things that we live in our life every day. We have to fight. We might give God a little bit of time 
You know, we might say a prayer before we eat. We might go to church once or twice a week. But it's a, such a small amount of time considering the life that we live in the world. You know what I mean? Almost, it would almost be like if you think about it, it'd be like, like, like Gomer, like spending all her day just running the streets. And Hosea's like, well, where's my wife? I got a feeling I know where she is. You know, she's running the towns, trying to flirt with other men and trying to get something from men and, and, get, and they're paying her and they're buying her all these gifts and all this kind of stuff. And, and, and it's running the street. And then at night, when it's time to go to bed, just pop in and be like, okay, you know, now I'll, you know, now I'll go home, take care of the, make sure the children are fed and do all this stuff. But the whole rest of the day, she's running around, you know, that's kind of like the Christian that just like, okay, I'll come to church because I'm supposed to be in church. And then the rest of the rest of the day, you know, the rest of the they're running around doing the things of the world, committing all kinds of sins and stuff like that. They're not trusting in God. They're not uh, having faith and in, in living right, living holy for God. How do you think God feels? You know, how, 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 we, we, we can just get a small glimpse at the life of Hosea and think, man, how terrible that must have been for Hosea. You know, this is his wife, the mother of his children. It's a little bit undecided what it means by children of whoredoms, like, like, did she act, were they actually his children or, or did she actually conceive children from other men and they're his children because she, he's married and so is it his responsibility? I don't know. But, uh, but how hard it must have been for Hosea to have to deal with that. But that doesn't even compare to what a perfect, loving God, all loving God, in, I mean, without flaw. You know, God's without flaw. When we mess up, when, when someone messes up that we love, we're, we can have forgiveness because it's like, you know, I've messed up before too. But when we sin against God, God does. God can't sin. He can't lie. He can't do any of these things. So think about how hard it is for him to just deal with the fact that he's died for us. He's given us everything, even though we're sinful, and yet we continue to live in sin, right? This is kind of what we get from the life of Gomer. I'm glad that Jesus shows mercy on, on us. I mean, there's stories in the Bible. If you talk about you know, adultery, for instance, people be like, oh, what about the woman that was, you know, she was uh, caught in the act of adultery. And Jesus, what did he say? You know, neither do I condemn thee. Go and sin no more. And, uh, and a lot of people make a big deal about that. Like, oh, you know, he could have condemned her, but he says, I'm not going to condemn you. How about the woman at the well? You know, he says, where's your husband? And she says, well, I don't have a husband. He said, you're right. You've had five husbands and the one that you're with now is not your husband. Right? And so he's really kind of condemning her for what she's doing. But everyone looks at that and says, yeah, but he has mercy on her. And she goes, he says, sin no more. And she goes and tells all the people and, and all this kind of stuff. Look, we understand God is a merciful God. Jesus forgives. Jesus is, was, was patient, loving, kind for everybody. But you still, you, you don't think that he's hurt whenever we sin against him. You don't think that he's still gonna, going to punish and allow us to reap the consequences we do, just like, just like Gomer did. And just like the nation of Israel, the nation of Judah, which is what, what was being pictured, they received a lot of, uh, of discipline to this day. As a nation, it receives uh, that, that discipline. Okay, so, but I'm glad of the, uh, of the story of Gomer as well that teaches us a valuable lesson. It's not an excuse to sin. It's not condoning sin in any way. It's just giving the reality of the fact that we do sin and we do mess up our life and make bad decisions and how hurtful that is to God and everybody else around. All right, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, I thank you uh, for the story, though we might not understand it, or the story of Jephthah. Lord, um, somebody might wonder how you could allow him to uh, to get away with sacrificing his daughter, or how you could, uh, you know, have uh, Hosea marry somebody who's going to uh, be a wife of whoredoms, and and how could you do certain things in the Bible? But at the end of the day, Lord, we know that you're perfect. We know that you know what's best. You've given us a perfect word. You've given us great uh, uh, warnings against sin and what will happen to us if we continue in sin, and. And you've given us great warnings on these things. So I pray you help us to just heed them. Help one another not to fall into sin. Lord, help us work together as a, as a church family uh, to keep each other uh, serving God and being loyal and faithful to God. I pray you receive the glory by what we do as a church. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.